Dr. Lauren Pang is an anomaly. He's a public uh, official. He is the public, no, sorry, the health state health officer for Maui County. And most people that are in these positions, they do what their boss says. They just keep in the box and go along. Not Dr. Pang. He takes his job, the, he takes his mission seriously. And his mission is public health, is health. And he will do that outside of the box even. So 12 years ago, he was here in the Paia Community Center and he first met GMO Free Maui. He didn't know anything about the issue before that day. He connected with them. He thought, oh my God, this is really important. He then went with them to the state convention. Uh, at the first group, there was about six people. Then the state convention, there was about 12 people. And as you can see, it's grown and grown. And all, all around the world, it's grown and grown. And in that time, they've done four court cases and they've won all of them. He's also gone to New Mexico about four years ago. He's going to Arizona. Uh, he's gone to Thailand nine years ago. He was in Brazil uh, the last six months and he spoke four times there. So we are very, very fortunate to have him here. He's, as he's uh, respected worldwide and he actually is willing, he's speaking as a private citizen because this is not sanctioned by, his, uh, by the department but uh, we're very fortunate to have a public health officer, a health officer who will speak outside the box. Dr. Lauren Peng. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, if you can't see the people on the edge, you can just kind of move over as long as you don't obstruct the, the film. Uh, first of all, I'm going to have to speak quite slowly and not have any slang because uh, Arizona asked me to send this forward and they would try to arrange as many events as they could around it. And I've always asked to debate. I'll debate whoever wants to debate with us on the TV or not on the TV. So I will speak very slowly and I won't point out and say, you know, out there in Paia. That, that's going to confuse the people from Arizona. But I do have to tell you a little bit about my background. I was born and raised in Honolulu. My, my grandmother, maybe my grandmother's mother, is from here in Paia. For the guys in Arizona, that's right here on the north shore of Maui. So they came in as sugar planter workers. And eventually, my grandfather became a banker. I guess they saw the promise in him. On my father's side, uh, <laughs> things were kind of rough. Uh, they started out as duck farmers in uh, the headwaters of Pao Valley, that's a little bit outside of Honolulu, and he died in the swine flu epidemic of 1918. So that left him with a stepfather who was, uh, you know, typical stepfather syndrome. So I inherited nothing from my stepfather, although he was a very, very smart guy. He wasn't in my lineage. I'm basically a duck farmer and a banker. So um, <clears throat> let's just kind of slowly ease into this. I've given this talk almost on a yearly basis for the last six years in Kauai with a college. And usually from GMO Free Hawaii, there were three advisors and then there's a member. There's one advisor for legal things, Paul Atichoff. He'll, he'll win all the suits. Then there is a ecologist, agriculture expert, emeritus professor Hector Valenzuela from the UH. He's fought with them. They've threatened to cut off his funds and he always protests and he's very prominent and then I will represent the health issues. So we have health, environmental and ag and legal. So let me just get started here. This is pretty easy. All of us kind of agree here. But as we go out to try to move the bill forward, you can imagine a room this size where maybe half the people don't know the issue, the other quarter really hates you, and a third, well that doesn't add up. 10% are going to tell you, you're affecting my job, okay? Then you have to kind of look in yourself, have the gumption to say what you believe is true, and hopefully I'll convince you some things that are true. I will tell you, this is basically the same presentation I've given for the last well, 10 years, but I keep adding things that the industry, Monsanto, Syngenta, Pioneer, they keep bringing up, and so you have to be able to think about them and respond. But let's get really basic here. The issue came about 
initially when we tried to move legislation because we're trying to protect taro or kalo. Uh, for those of you in Arizona, kalo is our native plant. It's almost synonymous with the Hawaiian culture because the firstborn son of, of the goddess, um, <clears throat> the firstborn son died and they buried him and from that spot sprung the kalo plant. The second born son, Haloa, is Haloa the man. So there's Haloa the kalo, Haloa the man. And they told the first man, uh, if you take care of your brother, he will take care of you. And to modify or patent or mess around with Hawaiian's kalo or taro is absolute no-no. But we went and tried to, we, well, we did, we blocked the genetic modification of kalo. The state, the, the, the state would not hear of this, so we went county to county. So Big Island, they blocked it, and it was uh, unanimous. The mayor overrode the veto, then they overrode the mayor's veto, and at the very last minute, the coffee farmer said, yeah, we want GMO-free coffee too. So they kind of got on that. The next, in, within nine months, we were here blocking GMO Kahlo in the field, in the market, and in the lab in Maui. Oh, by the way, the field, lab, market, it was blocked in the Big Island. Because when we saw GMO rice escape at the turn of, this, uh, turn of the century, 2000, no one could figure out how it escaped, field, lab, or market. So if you can't figure that out, you block them all, okay? So on Maui, we, we, we won, and it was blocked. Now, I have to bring this up now because it's kind of a warning. <laughs> we were in the middle of giving testimony before our county council about the un uncertainty and risk of GM kalo. I always speak about GM food, but the Hawaiians were there talking about kalo. Fine, we, we, we travel the same path sometimes. In the middle of the testimony, in the middle of my testimony, I told our county council, this might be the last time we talk about this because we are about to be preempted. That is the state pushed forth by the feds, passed the rule that no county can be more conservative for GM crops. Now that's a very strange preemption. Normally the preemption is a county can be more conservative, but not more liberal. This one, it was twisted. A county can be more liberal, but not more conservative. The county members were furious. They do not want to be preempted. And so a lot of them kind of interrupted the meeting, pulled the law, read it, and started talking because they filmed the county. And we kind of won that one, not on the issue, but because they were so upset about being preempted. We are always, there's always attempt to preempt the genetic modification control. There always is an attempt. So people are watching this and all that we do, lo and behold, one day they might say, it's illegal, you preempted. The other issue they might bring up one day, we're always afraid is, stop talking about this, this is a national security issue. <laughs> no, 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 wait, 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 wait. After 9-11, we had these talks for Homeland Security. And these guys came in from Texas and they talked about food security. And this guy from Texas, he kind of looked like Dick Cheney, so I kind of treated him like Dick Cheney. <laughs> he, said, he said, monocrops, GMOs, are the most dangerous thing of all. And I thought, hey, that's useful if I quote him. So after the conference, I went up kind of innocently, and I said, can I quote you? He goes, yeah, sure. Monocropping, GMOs, are very dangerous. When you get wiped out, you get wiped out. Now, I thought that was understood, but to hear him say that. So I said, well, so you'll speak against them here on the islands. He said, you don't understand. I said, what don't I understand? We want the enemy to have it, Iran and China, so you never have to invade them. You just say, I'll turn off your seed, or your seed might time bomb in three years. We want them to have it, but not us. And so I said, well, then why do we have it? I mean, we have it because we're sending them the seed. He said, well, you we kind of got to show that we have to have it so that they can think it's good for them to have it. It's like, whoa, I, I have like no idea. And that's when I decided, forget the politics, just do the science as I was raised. I went to high school here. 
Um, I went to Princeton University. After four years of mathematics, physics, and chemistry, I graduated with honors in chemistry. I did my medical school in Tulane in New Orleans. I have a master's in tropical medicine. After that, I spent <clears throat> 24 years overseas with the Walter Reed Institute of Research and the World Health Organization. My job was to test drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics against tropical diseases. In the year 2000, after 24 years overseas, we decided to come back because my parents were old, and I came back and I saw this problem here. So let's just get going here. Okay, the title of this talk, and it's the same title in Arizona, GMOs, Genetically Modified Organisms, Are We Gambling With Our Future? And it's a trick question because the answer definitely is no. And people say, wait, or, stop, whose side are you on? I can guarantee you, as you define gambling, we are not gambling with our future. Okay, here we go. And this is how I define gambling. You know, you play roulette. When you play roulette, you know how many black squares, you know how many red squares, and there's two greens. So you know the chance of losing, you know the chance of winning. And the chance of losing is always a little bit greater because there's the equal number of black and two greens, okay? But you know the odds of winning and losing. Okay, so that's how I define gambling. Let's talk basically what is genetic modification. Now, genetic engineering, it's almost, that they use the terms interchangeably, GE, genetic engineering, or GMO, genetically modified organism. So they try to engineer. This is the ideal situation this is what they want to do, their intention. So basically, they take the host, let's say it's a tomato. The tomato has a genome. The genome is the sum of all the genes linked together. For example, humans have 33,000 genes, and it's forever increasing because some of those pieces were called junk DNA, and we said, well, those aren't genes, and people said, yes, they are genes, but very interesting, every day we learn that those junk DNA, genes or not, are sometimes more important than the gene. But all the genes strung together are your genome, and that's your DNA. So all you really wanna do is take the gene from a foreign organism, like the fish, and you stick it in the, the gene of a tomato. I don't know, maybe Arizona guys call it tomato, but whatever. <laughs> Probably not. Okay, so you're gonna stick the thing in. Here it is, it's stuck in. And the gene is read by the RNA. I know that's hard to read, but it's read and makes a protein. The protein is what makes you, you. The DNA is the blueprint, but the protein expresses the gene. And so for example, uh, I, don't know, I, can't, I can't remember, but blue eyes or something. There's what, six genes that control that the length of your eyelash. There's a gene signals that fix that. I mean, how come your eyelashes don't grow this long? I mean, normal people. Okay. Oh, that's your eyebrow, your eyebrow, sorry. All right, so that's how it's called. The gene is expressed in the protein. But what's this blue and what's that green thing? Well, if you're going to put the gene in, you gotta turn it on. 98% of our 33,000 genes are quiet at any one time. So some are on when you're three years old, only when you're three. Some are on when you're 75, only when you're 75. And God help you if you get the signal switch. So sometimes we see little kids, they prematurely age because they turned their gene on at the wrong time. Some genes, oncogenes, genes, onco is cancer. Do you have the gene to make leukemia, cancers? And not just one of them, there's probably 10 leukemia genes if you turn those on, you get leukemia, okay? So they're silent, and there's orchestrated turning on at the right time. But if you're gonna put the red gene from the fish into the tomato, for all that trouble, you wanna turn it on. That's the green thing, it's called the promoter. The promoter is like an on switch, okay? Then there's a blue piece called the marker. When you put this thing in, you wanna know if it got there. Well, what's the problem? Because the way you put it in, how do you actually put this thing in? You get a petri dish of all this DNA material from the tomato. Then you get your little construct, the promoter, the marker, and the gene. You coat 
metal, you put it in a 22 shotgun thing, and you blast it into this plate, this receptive plate of cells with the DNA. And if it goes in, then the whole thing is turned on, and it starts to make the protein marker that I didn't draw. The protein marker is how you screen it to say, we got it. We got success. If it doesn't get in, you don't make the marker. And so that's how you blast away with the marker. And that's how it's supposed to work. That's the ideal situation. But how does it work? When you take the construct and you blast it away, it is true, sometimes there's a virus that can carry it. It's either virus or shotgun. Uh, it's kind of same effect. Look at this, you blast it away, and look what happened to your construct. Hey, there's a free promoter. Hey, there's a free uh, marker. Oh, that thing's in the wrong place. Oh, that thing is sitting on a gene or broke the gene. What, what's going on? Look at this. Here's the other one next to it because you blast it in a plate full of dishes, a plate full of cells. Look, you see those promoters? By convention, just they turn on, they're on switches, turning on the things downstream or to the right. I made it turn on this little blue thing. That blue protein is supposed to be silent. Maybe that's your oncogene, cancer. Maybe that's supposed to turn on when you're 75 or three. Whatever, you turned it on. Do you know what you turned on? Well, look, here's a successful piece right there. Isn't that good enough? Yeah, that was good. But what about all this other weird stuff? Look at that. There's a free gene here bridging the gap with no promoter. I guess that's silent. It's a mess. Okay? Furthermore, I was wrong to draw the genome like a line. It really is a three-dimensional twisted turn. I, I drew it like a mumble jumble. But it is quite organized. It's called flip in, flip out, writhe, torsions. And why is that important? Because when it folds on itself and you try to read, read the frame, sometimes you read cross bridge. It's called the shifting frame. And so if there's one thing we learned in the last 10 years, it's how little we, learn, we know about genetics and genome. Now, the scientists will tell you, I'm a scientist but you should know how little you know, and that has been shown in the last 10 years. When I went through school, the idea was one gene makes one protein. If you put anything else, you got an F. That was so basic, you got an F. Now we know in the humans, we have 33,000 genes, it makes 100,000 proteins. So on the average, how can one gene make three proteins? I thought you said it reads it down the line. Well, it reads it crosswise. The frame can shift, it can read this part and continue on. Now that's stupendous. We went from one gene, one protein, to one gene, three proteins. Furthermore, there's tons of material in between that we had no idea what we were doing, and we called it junk. It turns out to be the orchestrators. It's called the RNA series. Never mind if you can't read it, okay? That's one thing. One gene doesn't make one protein. The next thing we learn is a lot of our genes are shared amongst the plant and animal kingdom. Whoa, you mean, you, you mean my area is malaria. The malaria parasite shares a gene that makes a pump that pumps out drugs. So every time you try to poison the malaria parasite, it's resistant because the drug pumps it out. Guess what? That pump, that gene for that pump is in my liver. That's how my liver detoxifies things. How in the world did I get the same gene as the malaria parasite? Do you think we had common ancestors that had sex. No, that's a tantalizing thought. What really is true is that there are, there are gene exchanges through the viruses. The viruses go into an animal, it hijacks and it incorporates itself in the genome, takes it over, then moves out and infects another species. And it will share the genes. If that gene is useful, like this pump, to detoxify your liver, to detoxify the malaria parasite, if it's useful, we can retain it. If it's not useful, and our ancestors have paid the price, in history of mankind, I guarantee you, viruses brought us some pretty weird, useless stuff. Well, that lineage of people died out. We have paid the price. Remember that. You are who you are, kind of adapted to this environment because your ancestors paid the price, okay? 
Now, one more interesting thing we always learned. So some genes are silent, and they shouldn't be turned on. We share a lot of genes, and then there's this one gene making three proteins. Those silent areas, they used to call junk DNA. We are learning that they're the orchestrators. And I want you to remember, this is very good. Sometimes the analogy is kind of infantile, but you can remember it best this way. You have a gene from the fish. You put it in the tomato. Okay? That's like taking the tuba. I, I was in the band, you know, the high school band. That's like taking the tuba player. I, I didn't play the tuba. I played the trombone. That's like taking the tuba player and throwing him in the football team in the middle of the game. First of all, the tuba player, when he lands in the football team, I guess he knocked out the quarterback. OK, fine. Can't help that. Next, the tuba player, the on switch promoter, is always on. So he's playing, and you tell him, shut up. We're trying to play the game. But he's always on, and there's no orchestration. Okay? And the final thing is right here, right here. These genes that don't belong there, they're from other species, they're called promiscuous. They either move out because the tuba player doesn't belong in the football team, and they push him to the girls' volleyball team, and he's happily playing the tuba, being disruptive. These are called promiscuous genes. Genes that don't belong there move out, or they amplify. In other words, one copy, oh, there's one. The next time it replicates is 2, 4, 8, 16. So amplification, amplification. That was my area of research. There was one poor worm. We gave him a foreign gene. And after seven generations, I think 56% of his gene was that gene. What do you think he's doing, making tons of useless protein? This has to do with GMO crops, doesn't it? You put in a construct that forever is producing that red thing. You're not supposed to turn it on all the time. You're supposed to turn it on when you need it. That's called epigenetics. So you made it so it's always on. That's wasteful. And when you do wasteful stuff, you are attacked by the other microbes, the viruses, the parasites, the fungus. You forever weaken the other areas. That's like a guy who's so obsessed with football that he can't cross the street. That is the why gene, GMOs are almost synonymous with sterilizing the fields so that they cannot be attacked by the other microbes. Now, we learned this, and they learned this too, because it wasn't supposed to be like that. But that's why the suit is in Kauai. The amount of pesticides they use. You think sugarcane, you think pineapple's bad. You should see what they're doing in the GM fields. We sued, there was disclosure. And some of these pesticides, I have no idea what they are, but there's a whole bunch of them. Okay? So remember that. It's, it, because of the nature of the setup, that's how it's going to go. Now, never mind, you can't read it, but this was for the Arizona people and Bruce. These are the references that tell you about these moving to other species. That's called horizontal gene transfer. OK, so that's basically what happens. And that was the intention. Now, look. Everything I told you was plants, you know, plants. So they take the plant, they take this modification, there's a mutation, they want to see if it's stable. You put it in, but all kinds of weird stuff might happen. So you bring it out to the conditions, and you put it out here under rain, sun, fertilizer, just to see if it's good, if it's stable, consistent, okay? Then all the weird stuff dies, and you amplify the good stuff, and you select the consistent product, and then you make seed and ship it out for other people to grow, and you say, this is probably consistent. So all the plants are plants. Plants are plants. And so the industry, they always say, Dr. Peng, you're a human health guy. Don't talk about plants. Plants are plants, and humans are humans. OK? In the humans, oh, let me press the button here. In the humans, we have done GMOs long before the plant guys did it. And we called it gene therapy. And this was not taking tomato to human or fish to human. It was taking human to human. Hey, I'm matching the species. What more do you want? And so don't try to read this. This is just a quote because guys who get the PowerPoint can read this themselves. There were two boys in Philadelphia. They had severe combined immunodeficiency, SCID. 
boys in the bubble. They couldn't come out. They would be attacked. They didn't have immunity. And they got real tired of living that way. And so one day, the medical people said, would you like to try to take the gene that's in everybody else and put it in you so you can live like normal people? And they said, yes. Okay. Now, when you put the gene in the boy that gave them immunity, you're stuck on a promoter. Like I said, why put it in if it's going to be quiet? Okay. And they might have put on a marker. I can't remember. So they injected the boys and the genes went into the bodies of the immune cells. And what happened? Did they get immune? Well, we don't know. They died of cancer. You turned on the leukemia genes by mistake. This is published in New England Journal of Medicine. This is our lead medical journal. Furthermore, they did a study to say, whoa, how unlucky. You turned on the wrong gene, the leukemia gene. That was more than luck. They actually calculated there was a fourfold above luck. In other words, those leukemia genes called the promoters. They can't wait to turn on. And so the medical people, we have a moratorium on gene therapy. Gene therapy has one of the, been the biggest disappointment ever in the, like, in the last uh, 40 years of medicine. It was so much promise, but when we realize the genes are so complicated that we have a moratorium until you can put exactly where you want it, not turn on the leukemia gene. You can turn on exactly what you want. So even if you put in the wrong thing, don't turn it on. If it's a mistake, you can pull it out or you can turn it off. The four conditions. We can't do one of them. And so the medical guys, we're very alarmed and we don't do it, okay? But the plant guys, hey, well, the plant guys are plant guys, except for one problem here. Now, let, let me get this. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. When you grow these plants and eat these plants, these doctors, Travik from Norway, Ermakova from Russia, Putstai, Pakistani in England. Putstai's work has been questioned. Even he admits something wasn't quite right. But Ermakova, Travik, there's tons of them now. They have shown that an animal, like a mouse, when fed GM food, the, 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 the construct, the marker, the promoter, and the, uh, the gene will go into the stomach cells of the rat and turn on within two hours of first feeding. That is one heck of a transfer. But I warned you that these are promiscuous genes and they go out and turn in. You've constructed the gene so it can cross species. Well, what did you expect it to do when you go into the mouse? And it not in the mouse stomach, in the mouse stomach cells and was on. Then in six hours, you know, the stomach, the blood goes up into the lymph nodes. It's in the lymph nodes and on. So that was the mouse or the rat, maybe the rat. But they also, Travik, did cultures, human tissue cultures, kidney, intestine. Not a human, but he puts these genetic things from the plants on and they incorporate in the cell tissue. The stuff is crossing and it's active. Even Monsanto will admit they're active. Okay? So the stuff does cross into mammalian and human cell lines. Dr. Ermakova, uh, she was Russian and she did very interesting studies. She fed the mice GM food and the mice she was looking at birth defects and diminished litter size, which means birth defect in utero so they never delivered. And she saw a bunch of them. The industry tried to repeat it and couldn't repeat what she saw. She tried to repeat it and couldn't repeat what she saw. She tried to repeat it again and saw it again. The stuff, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. In my field of science, drugs and vaccines, you will not do any study in the lab, in the animals, or in humans until you can produce the product consistently. There's a principle called GMP. It's almost like GMO. Good manufacturing practice. If you cannot produce it consistently, don't bother testing because the testing will be all over the board, which seems to be what we see. But that was perfect for the industry because when Ermakova showed it and they didn't, and then she didn't, and then they did, they will use the negative data, looks safe to me, to negate her positive data. That's not how science works. You don't use negative data to refute positive data. You wanna do that? I can take, all of us decide we should smoke. Some of us get cancer, some of us don't. 
the guys who don't, does that mean these guys don't get cancer? You don't use negative data to refute positive data, number one. Number two, you don't even try to interpret a study until the product is made consistently, okay? And the product, believe me, they can make it maybe consistent for the intended product, but all those weird things going on, those free promoters turning things on there, we don't even know how to screen for that. So that's a problem, okay? Now, the stuff is active and crossing. This is kind of a mess. I'll go through this pretty quickly. I have messed with GM products. We took a genetically modified vaccine and we tested it in HIV patients. It was for hepatitis B. But how did we do it? We produced it in the laboratory where it was contained in a biosafety lab. The mutation, the, the gene mutation didn't escape. We purified the protein of the modification. Remember the express protein. That's not GMO. That doesn't have a promoter. That's the product. We purified the product. We took it to market. We labeled it. We gave it to the people who should get it, high dose, HIV. And we only use it for HIV patients, and it's labeled. When there's a mistake, and there's been quite a few mistakes with different products, we recall it. I think it was worthwhile the risk and benefit, but you see how it's done. Contained, labeled, marketed, used as indicated. Here we have the GM field products growing wily nily. It is in the wind, it is in the soil, it is next to our elementary school kids, it's in the wastewater, it's in the workers, it's in the community. And these guys called me and they said, can you help us? The, um, there's the dust, we're breathing the dust. And I said, oh, that's bad. Isn't there any protection? They said, no, no, no. All the, all the wives are trying to make these handkerchiefs. And they said, but the bag says not for human consumption. But they're breathing the dust. And I said, wow, I'll check this out. So I called state, 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 Department of Labor. I said, hey, 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 the guys are breathing uncontrolled the dust. And the bag says not for human consumption. So the guy says, well, they're not eating it, are they? Oh. And wait, wait, this gets even <laughs> stranger. He said, I said, wait, 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 they're breathing it. That's a heavy duty exposure. He says, are you a doctor? I said, yes. He said, I'll call you back. I'll call you back, and he never did. And I called him again, and he never called me back again. So I'm used to getting stonewalled, but this kind of stuff, I mean, that has got to stop. Incidentally, those guys are not dumb. They came out first with a salivary gland tumor, a tumor, and they actually said, we know we can never prove this, but for the rest of us breathing the dust, can you help us? So the Department of Labor, Department of Labor, try to take a stand on this stuff. Now, it's in the field, and then, lo and behold, these guys try to grow food that makes pharmaceuticals. Wow, so you grow the corn, not for some pharmaceuticals, but to harvest insulin, to harvest, harvest spermicides. You can make the corn or the plant do anything. Almost like we use the term plant for a factory. The plant is a plant that can make products. And then we eat the stuff. Now, do you not think GMOs are dangerous? Industry will say harm has never been shown. Well, there was one product. It's the most fascinating thing I've ever read. And it goes by the acronym TGN1412. And this was a GM product tested in, correctly, tested in humans first before it went to market, and it was some immunomodulator, like the one they tried to bring into Kona, which we blocked, and they give it to 10 guys. But, but first they gave it to dogs. The dogs did real well. And they gave 150th the dose to 10 people in the UK. That made front page headlines in Star Bulletin and Maui News. I have never seen a study of 10 people make front page in, done in the UK appear in Star Bulletin because it was the most bizarre medical things we have ever seen, okay? Now, that was strange. I don't know if they got the mutation or just the product or the product and the mutation. Who knows? But they quickly, Tejero is the name of the company, shut that down and don't talk about it. And there was an inquiry worldwide, thank goodness for New Zealand. The prime minister of New Zealand said, was that a GMO product? and they refused to answer, Stonewall, and they found out it was. So she says, it was a GMO product. Thank God for once you did the normal testing and we didn't release it in fields like they tried to do in Kona 
which we blocked. Okay, an immunomodulator was coming down to Kona in the algae. Okay, then what did the company say? Oh, you know all that weird stuff? Must have been a contaminant. Must have been a contaminant. That's gray area, isn't it? All those unintended spots. What are you going to do? Call that contaminant? So the German government said, contaminant or not, it was made to the correct recipe. And if it was a contaminant, it's inevitable in your product. So that company quickly shut down, never to be heard from again. There's other companies that were messing and they were shut down. Do not rain on our parade. Let us go with the food. Okay, so that was a little bit scary. Now, wait, let me get the things here. Okay, what do we propose? I learned, I always learned, the precautionary principle. Before, you can take any product you want, and we're about to give it to humans, or put it in the environment. Before you do that, you have to generate data, 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 not opinion, to show the benefit to risk of each of your products. So we do it for aspirin, we do it for flu vaccine, we do it for each product. You don't trust the company. You don't say Merck, Merck Sharp and Dome. Like, you guys do a good job, cut loose, do whatever you want. You sure they don't do it for Monsanto? You know, hey, you guys did a good job there. Go make whatever you want. It's for each product. Okay? And how do we show the data? Now is my chance to ad lib. In the field of science, there are four areas which I've learned are so complicated, we only evaluate them empirically. We observe. We don't try to guess what's going to happen. One is the brain. If, my God, you know, when I went through surgery, you could cut that part and you could cut the bone, and we kind of figured out if I cut the bone, that thing is going to happen there, and I better not cut that. But when you mess with the brain, holy cow, you should do some general stuff like don't infect the guy, but we do our best so he doesn't bleed, and we stand back and, oh, did you see what happened on that? Because the brain is very complicated. The next area complicated is the gene, the genome. And we learn this every day. The next area is environment. Even a mulch pile, you know, mulch, I was talking to Greenleaf today, that's it, that's complicated. You mess with one thing, you have no idea what you're causing. So when we get data, does that mean we can't study it? Of course not. That means we do stuff to it. That's a guy looking in binoculars, and he's looking to see what he sees. Generally, there's two groups, the treatment group and the control group, and that's called empirical data. He just observes because he doesn't have the arrogance to say, this is going to happen. There's one more area that's real complicated. We have no idea what we're doing. We don't manipulate it. <laughs> deep space. We can't manipulate deep space. All we do is observe and go, oh, look at that. Look at those black holes. Look at those white dwarfs. Look at those viable planets. So we observe, and we have learned to respect things that we don't understand. Okay. Then, once we generate the risk and benefit, we compare the ratios amongst the alternatives. You want this or you want that. And then, we usually compare it, we make sure we have the standard treatment, and if the benefits outweigh the risk, we go forward. We mark it on a provisional basis. If we do the trials, we test them in animals, we test them in humans, phase one, two, three, all the way to humans, then we go marketing, and we label it, and we monitor post-market. And 50% of our drugs and vaccines, 50%, severe side effects are seen post-marketing. We either pull them back or we relabel them not to be used with these conditions. So post-marketing is very, very important. But post-marketing means labeling. Until this step, we always, always get informed consent. Like, we don't really know the risk-benefit. We get some ideas, but we don't really know until 20 years of post-marketing. So when you're about to take this, would you please sign this that you got informed consent? This is, not a, <clears throat> this is not a CYA maneuver so you don't get sued. I truly inform, con, inform you, we don't know too much about this. We think the benefits outweigh the risk. Want to try? You're going to say, whoa, when I start getting sick and you stop the drug, is, is that good? Am I home free? Sometimes I say, <clears throat> well, the boys in Philadelphia, when we stop that, gene transfer, they had leukemia. So in some things, in humans, 
Once again, the complex things, genetics, some things, by the time we see it, it's too late. Cancer and birth defects. Some things in the environment, once you see it, life form, GMOs are life form, DNA, it's too late. So I was a little bit surprised that some of our politicians in that publication of Maui Weekly said, I'm for, I'm for biotech until it's proven harmful. My friend, until the time you prove it's harmful, in the, in the environment, a life form is irreversible. Like the, okay. like the cokey frog, like the fire ant, like the varroa mite. Now that I see it's harmful, it's too late. In humans, the irreversible too late effect is cancer and um, birth defects, and then all those strange things we saw with TGN 1412. You never hear the follow-up, what happened to those guys, if it reversed once you stopped it, okay? Now, give you a very good example because Monsanto was here. They flew in a guy, a professor from Kansas, about seven years ago. And he says, hey, hey, all that precautionary principle, that's all archaic, that's right, old. And I asked him, you mean old and worthless or old? He said, it's old and worthless because nothing is perfectly safe. You could get run over crossing the street. Now, is, is, is that what the precautionary principle says? No, it says, doesn't say it has to be perfectly safe, zero toxicity. It has said you know the toxicity, you know the benefits, you weigh it against the alternatives, and you move forward. And I said, cancer chemotherapy, that's one heck of a toxic thing, but it's your chance to cure. You weigh the toxicity against the efficacy, cancer chemotherapy, you weigh it against the alternative, do nothing, or that other drug, and we move forward. He didn't have any response. When they don't have a response, they're quiet. But I was dying to find out what does he use. And we will show what he uses later, because it took me a long time to, to figure out what they were trying to say. It wasn't that complicated. It's just I keep forgetting stuff when it doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm serious. I, I've looked this up five times. But here is the World Health Organiza Organization position in 2004. 2004 published in the newspaper in Bangkok. At this point, we have no evidence to say that it is dangerous to consume food products that contain GMOs. Okay. But at the same time, we also don't know its negative side. So we have to say we do not know the adverse health effects of GM food. And this was the WHO woman saying that. Now, I hate to do this, but if it helps you remember, this is it. This is how I do it in Kauai, in the classroom. See that tube? Trust me, there's a mixture of chemicals here. I kind of don't know what they were. At one time I did, but I forgot. Um, I never did test this for harm or safety. So no harm has been shown. I guarantee you no harm has been shown. No safety has been shown. Shall we all drink this? <laughs> and if we did drink this, when it caused something irreversible, whoa, you think we can fix it? No. So be very careful. They love to say no harm has been shown. Repeatedly when we give testimony in Kauai, the first thing they say is, has harm been shown? Has harm been shown? Show me the data. And I said, what? Well, look, no harm has been shown. Want to drink this? No harm has been shown. So if it helps you to remember, remember this. Furthermore, this is one heck of an inconsistent product. If it did hurt you or help you, I don't think I could repeat it because it's inconsistent. Okay? Now, don't try to ask me what it is because I truly don't know. Okay? But it's three things, organic. Now, this is a mess. I will explain this to you. You don't have to try to read this. But the guys in Arizona are going to get the PowerPoint and they can look and get, well, that's what he's trying to say. So it's for them. This is risk assessment. Monsanto brought in the professor from Kansas. He says, we do risk assessment. What the heck is that? So <laughs> Wikipedia, I'm asking people risk assessment. And risk assessment has this kind of wheel going around. Step one, you start here, is to identify the hazards. Well, what hazard? When you blast it away in a gene, oh, I don't know what you made. Someone here, someone there. And it's been proven. There are many unintentional expressions of genes and proteins. Well, did you mean to mean that? I don't know. Yeah, there's plenty of extra stuff. Is it hazardous? I don't know. So you're supposed to identify the hazard. I can't do that. Once you identify the hazard, you're supposed to say, are there known rules to contain this hazard, if you could identify it? And I can tell you one thing. Never mind if you can read this. I'll read it for you. When you have a hazard or a product you don't know, we said this before, 
and you go to use it. Like we had to treat the grandma with an experimental chemotherapy. And I said, I really don't know what this is. 10% chance side effect will kill you. 30% chance it will cure you, but I'm not sure, okay? Because we didn't test it in tons of people. She signs informed consent, okay? So then you identify the dose and the mechanism. They will guess the dose response. That's the next step. We can do that, maybe they do that, maybe they don't, because they don't even know what hazard. Then they would describe how you avoid it. Stay up when, put the mask on, don't put the mask on, wash your clothes once a day. And then you're supposed to reassess and go back in the loop and say, you know what? Five of those things were not hazardous, but 10 more are. The reassess, it feeds back in. In this loop, what are they missing? Since they made the loop, since the guy was here, we have seen all the animal data. The animal data is stupendous. Not uniform because the product's inconsistent. But don't you think you should feed it back in the loop to tell us there's hazards? Don't you think you should say, you know, there seems to be unknown hazards. It's not A, B, or C, but the animals are still acting weird. And that is called the empirical. We gave a bunch of stuff. I cleaned up as best I could the products, and they're still having problems. So it feeds back. Right now, the GMO guys are moving through here. They refuse to accept the animal data because animals are animals. Humans are humans. That's a fair statement, but it's very indicative that trouble is coming down the line. The next thing they will tell you, mm, this really bothers me, is that, hey, 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 we've eaten maybe 100 million GMO meals. We've seen nothing. Now, first of all, that statement, we've seen nothing, doesn't mean you looked. Case in point is cigarettes. We did not show cigarettes cause cancer until the mid-50s. We were smoking since 1890. How many billions of cigarettes were smoked? And we didn't see nothing until 1950. Oh, but now we're all tuned in. I know to look for smoke, really. How much longer until we saw secondhand smoke? 20 years. I mean, we're primed to look at smoke, and 20 years before we said secondhand smoke is causing it. So number one, I don't think you looked, okay? Just saying we didn't see anything. Number two, when I studied cigarettes for causing cancer, I knew who smoked. I see you smoked. You know you smoked. You didn't. The GMO products are unlabeled. I cannot sort it out. I cannot sort it out. And we are certainly seeing a rise in many conditions, but I can't sort it out. So I, don't, I do not agree at all that we are not seeing anything or that it, we've eaten 100 million meals and we didn't see anything, so it's okay. That's not true. But suppose it was. Suppose God tells you, Dr. Peng, that was true. You ate 100 million meals, and I guarantee you, nobody had a side effect. Now, that's in the last, what, 12 years, we ate 100 million meals? 12 years ago, when we didn't know, when you didn't have this retrospective data to kind of feel good about safety, and you launched a product which we didn't fully know, where is the informed consent? You were supposed to, now, hey, informed consent. My goodness, I wrestled with this. We had a live vaccine for Shigella. It's a bad disease. We tested it in Bangladesh, live. So we had to get people's consent. Like, do you promise, would you like this vaccine? Here's the risk, here's the benefits, here's the alternatives, you know, what do you think? And so got some guys signed. But we had to go to the whole village because it was live. It might go from her to her to him. Oh, we had to go to the whole village. The village headman said, I'll sign for the whole village. The World Health Organization said, no, you won't. You will go to the entire village and probably those two villages over there to get everyone's informed consent. GMO papaya, the one released on the big island that saved the papaya industry, fine, fine, you saved the papaya industry. That's a benefit. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Maybe there's been no health effects. I don't agree. But if you use historical data to say, see, we've eaten it, I feel okay. When you first released it and it was unknown for health effects, where is the informed consent? Yeah. Now, I know I didn't sign it because I have a place on the big island. I'm surrounded by Jim papaya, which is growing that I never meant to plant. I didn't sign it. So who's responsible here? The industry? The university? No. The regulators, the guys who are supposed to say, go to the ethical committee, ask them where is the informed consent? 
And if the, regular, the ethical committee from Cornell, the guys from Cornell, says, we didn't think it was needed, I want the ethical committee investigated. Now, I've asked for ethical committees to be investigated from the feds. I've been asking nine years, and all I get is stonewalling. Okay? So it's with the regulators. You expect the industry to kind of get away with what they can get away with. I expect that. But the regulators, oops, asleep at the wheel. Look, see this guy? This picture here. They use, in this model, it's called deterministic. Deterministic is not observational. It is, I saw the billiard ball, the cue ball hit the eight ball, and one thing led to another. It's mechanistic. It's simple. You try to describe. That's what they're hoping for that one gene, one protein, we're going to put the gene in, it's going to express the protein, and that's it. Unfortunately, the genome is so complex, you cannot predict deterministics, one gene, one protein. You can't. But this is what the model is based on, and it's wrong to base it on the model. It's simply wrong. You should observe it. So, hey, we could end the, pro the discussion here. Precautionary principle, ask for data. I showed you there's no data. I showed you what we use, precautionary print. I showed you what they use. I showed you the WHO position, okay? They will tell you, Dr. Peck, the recent WHO position, 2012, says risk assessment shows it to be safe. Now, I looked at that, 2012, but I also saw the exact same message in 2001. So they took the 2001 data. 2004 says we don't really have data. They took this one and put it in 2012. I don't care. If you're going to have two opinions, just show me the data. Show me the data. Because when I worked for them, it was data driven. All you have to do is show me the data. Here is one group that is so smart, they don't need the data. And we listen to them. This group is the National Academy of Science. It's a purple book, free online. I would have brought the book, but I've been through five copies. I keep wearing out my copies. Actually, that good. And it's the Institute of Medicine, and it's called Safety of Genetically Engineered Foods, Approaches to Assessing Unintended Health Effects. Unintended Health Effects. So I get the book. These guys are smart, 2003, and I start to read the book. Now, I'll explain it. Never mind, you can't see it. There's a graph here that appears twice in the book. Oh, that's funny, same graph two times. This is all the ways you can modify plant. Standard cross-pollination, do something else, and I put a star by all the GMO methods. So here's all the ways you can modify plant. On this axis is the likelihood, highly likely, not really likely, of unintended health effects. So you can see these three stars here, highly likely for unintended health effects, more so than the regular food, okay? So everybody points to this. Everyone says the NIH. The National Academy, they're real smart. So let's all use the same graph. It's an interesting graph, yeah? So the first thing in Maui, people who don't like me, said it doesn't, it doesn't say health effects. This is unintended effects, it doesn't say health. The title of the book is health effects. Believe me, it, it says health effects. So they stopped saying that. Next, the next thing they said, well, first of all, one more thing. You see the center point? That's the mean. So this has a higher unintended health effect than that standard cross. There's one. That looks like a pretty safe way. I don't know what that is. That's some genetic way. But besides the mean, you see the scatter? That's the variance. That's the inconsistency. So you've got two problems here. More unintended health effects, and gosh knows. Maybe Ormakova saw it, didn't. Didn't, then she saw it. No wonder it's all over the board. You can't make the thing consistently. And this is expanding on this, let's go here. First they said, these are not health things. I said, they are health things. Next, seven years ago, Honolulu, Hawaii, Hawaii uh, Pediatrics Group, whatever, association or something, Pediatrics. Monsanto flew in, doctors from Duke, Harvard, UC Davis, I think, doctors, to present to the pediatricians, uh, there's really no problem. Well, I, you know, I thought these guys were going to be smart. I was waiting for some cogent argument. First, they said, <clears throat> this is what they said. Anything you see with GMO, you can see with normal food. I said, yeah, I, I agree. You see bloody nose, you see bloody nose. You see cancer, you see cancer. Stomach ache, stomach ache. But 
In GMOs, you see more. There's no question. There's a quantitative argument. They never responded. They had to catch a plane. Okay. I mean, I have nothing against Harvard, Duke, and UC, but for, for crying out loud, answer the question. Okay? Then the woman from Duke, she's kind of smart. She goes, well, well, I'm not talking about all side effects. I'm talking about known allergens. Well, I'm talking about unknown weird stuff, like the guys on TGN 1412. Those were beyond allergies. Okay? The next issue. Seven years later, a very prominent scientist from Penn State she finally kind of, this is getting viral, and she says, yep, 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 more unintended effects. Health effects, we agree with you, Dr. Frank, but they're not all bad. They're not, really, you know, it kind of sounds good. On face value, they're not all bad. Well, hmm. are you telling me that a bad effect for the head cancels out a good effect for the kidney? Is that what you're telling me? Or oh, within the kidney, there's four mechanisms of making urine bad for the glomeruli, good for the tubules, so it cancels out. My friends, this is how we do drugs. There's some good effects and bad effects. I ask you, what's your problem? This drug will help your head, but not your kidney. And you say, yes, I, oops. <laughs> I want my head to be helped, and my kidneys are pretty good. They can withstand an onslaught. So I tailor it to you. We never say good kind of lumps together. We sort it out. You test it. You don't blindly say, well, it kind of all adds up. Okay? It doesn't. You guess wrong. Furthermore, if you're in perfect health, why in the world should you eat GM food that is bad for one thing and good for the other? You can't improve on what you're good at, and all you're going to do is risk something bad. So they kind of stop bringing up that argument. But I heard when I'm not in the room, when you're by yourself, they will bring that up. Okay, so I want you to say, hey, that doesn't make sense, or at least Try to convince yourself it doesn't make sense and say it. Now, never mind this. This is Department of Ag, and this is essentially Tom Vilsack, he says, i summarize it for you, it says, uh, science can show anything you want. <laughs> not, your kind of, not my kind of science. This guy's a lawyer, and for a lawyer to say, scientists can show whatever you want. You want to show that? Do that. You want to show that? That's wrong. That's not my kind of science. Okay. But he said that, and he kind of published it because he has the bully pulpit. And so he talks about the contamination of alfalfa. And this is why he said science can make, show anything you want. Well, of course it can when the stuff is inconsistent. Sometimes it shows that, sometimes it shows that. You choose what you want. I mean, that's kind of silly, OK? But ew, heavily conflicted of interest. Here is something. Who controls your food and drugs? The FDA. This is 2007. The FDA, a report by FDA scientists of the FDA administrators, who is Mike, one is Michael Taylor, a lawyer from Monsanto. Wow. Yeah, well, I mean, there's worse. It used to be like other people, but they move along, and it's called incestuous relationship. They forever exchange. But the scientists were fed up with it, and they put out this report, FDA, science and mission at risk. Oh, try to look for this because they're trying to take this down quickly. It's this blue thing with the test tubes. And it summarizes, you can go through the data, and I'll summarize it for you. The FDA, as currently configured, the administrators, they do not know the science of genomics. They can't afford or not willing to spend to get it. And they do not believe in it. Well, it's hard to believe in something you don't know, so I kind of get it. You don't believe, you don't know it, and you can't afford it, okay? And it says it's especially true in the section of food safety. But it says one nice thing, kind of about me. No, it doesn't say particularly about me, but it says it here, I'll, I'll read it for you. There is a statement in here that the FDA, as incapable as they are of understanding genomics, there is one group that can do science correctly, empirically. That's the drug and vaccine guys. Okay? Now, when I was with WHO in 1992 onward, we tried to coordinate all the agencies from Europe, Australia, Japan, FDA, to get on the same sheet of music, and we thought we kind of did a good job. Well, it's nice to know we kind of did a good job, and it's nice to know that what we thought and the principles we based it on hold true, regardless of what these guys want to do. Okay, so thank goodness I was redeeming. Here is something new. This is pediatric, pediatricians concerned about childhood pesticide exposure. Mm -hmm. The American Academy of Pediatrics, 
They are asking, here's all the websites, there's an alert in the last 2011 that pediatricians should look very, very carefully at the pesticides that the kids are exposed to. Kids are very sensitive and they are very alarmed because of the combination. ABC News, Richard Besser, that medical guy, he used to be head of CDC. He's telling Dan Sawyer, oh, what we're really worried about is the pesticides in the food. And it's called the dirty dozen, the ones with the most pesticides. And he says, some of this stuff can't be washed out. Well, what do you expect when you incorporate it in genetically engineered? And so Diane Sawyer says, gee, Richard, what should we do? He says, eat organic. Richard Besser, former head of CDC, goes makes the statement. American Academy of Pediatrics backs this up. Is this about GMOs or is this about pesticides? It's about both. The way they have learned, you have to sterilize the fields to grow the GMOs. And that's why we've got so many pesticides. And then, look at this. This was uh, 2009. This is a fantastic study that Roundup, the old Roundup, that we thought was safe, actually is pretty safe, alone. But there's a carrier molecule with it. It's called a surfactant. It's kind of like a detergent. It kind of breaks down the cell wall so the Roundup can penetrate. Well, did they test the surfactant alone? They could have, but they really didn't. But if they did, surfactant alone is OK. It breaks down the wall, but there's no penetrating toxin. Roundup alone cannot penetrate because there's no surfactant. But lo and behold, Seralini, these guys out of uh, France, they actually test the combination. And this goes, hey, look, in combination, it's horrid. And in test tubes, in cell cultures, and he said, this is what's leading to birth defects. This is a very good article because Monsanto responds. And Monsanto said, hey, 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 you know that test tube stuff? That's not real life, okay? That's not real life. Who is seeing real life? Argentina, go on the internet. Argentina blocked Monsanto's entrance because of birth defects. And what does Monsanto say now about real life? They were here. They came to debate me five years ago in front of the Maui Medical Society. Dr. Goldstein, the lead medical guy from Monsanto. And he said, we can never, I said, have you tested these things for safety? He said, nope, nope, thank God you agree. And we can never do it. I said, you can never test GMO foods for safety? He said, nope, because when we go out and feed it to all of you guys, there's so many confounding variables, like, oh, you got a stomach ache. Maybe that was the, from the aspirin you took. In fact, when Latin America said we had birth defects from the Monsanto, the GMOs, he said, hey, maybe it's those pesticides. Kind of forgot that you guys do pesticides and. Them. <laughs> but he said there's so many confounding variables that to test it, I can almost quote, you have to take somebody, lock them away for 30 years, and feed them nothing but GMO foods in a controlled environment. So check this out. When they do the controlled environment, the French, that's not real life. When we ask to do the real life study by labeling it, oh no, no, that's not, that, that's not control. So neither is good enough for them, so they claim it's neither. In reality, it's both. When you test for toxicity, you do the control study first, kind of get your feet on the ground, then you move to real life. That's how we do it, post-marketing. Now the Maui Medical Society was a little bit alarmed because the next guy to talk, we have a drug, uh, Lipitor for cholesterol, and he says, well, I'm glad we tested that in real life because grapefruit juice interferes with Lipitor. So we would never know that unless we tested it in real life. I mean, it's kind of strange for him to say that. But he said it, and I, since he said it, I can forever quote him. Now, there's a very good group, American Academy of Environmental Medicine. Look for the logo. 300 Americans and Canadians, physicians, PhDs. But beyond that, they're common sense. I mean, the guy from Monsanto is an MD too. I'm just looking for some common sense or some answers. These guys have a very strong position, came out in 2009, and they helped us when we were blocking GM column. Their position is all physicians should tell all their patients, we do not know the risk of GM foods. I'm not saying they're harmful. It's just like that little vial of white stuff. I don't know what the risks are. Second, <laughs> these recommendations get pretty strong. When you see something unusual, quantitative or qualitative, in your population, you are to consider genetically modified foods. Okay. Now, me, I would consider pesticides too, now that we know that pesticides. Next, they claim they want a moratorium on these products till an independent group proves they're safe. 
And the ones already out there that we can't seem to call back, label. Notice they don't say the word ban. We don't like the word ban because it sounds kind of emotional. We like moratorium until you, or whatever. Trust me, try to stick with moratorium. If you told me we had a kind of risky GM food, but I think we're gonna cure cancer, whoa, the benefits might outweigh the risk and we move forward. A ban sounds too subjective. You know, I hate this, I hate you, I hate this. We go with moratorium until da da da. When we win in court, it's based on the EIS, environmental impact statements. You've not done an EIS, environmental or health, and this is a life form. So the judge says, hey, I agree with you. No, until you can do this, okay? Okay, wait, let's, ooh. Second page, oh, this is a two page thing. It's very easy to read. The second page is full, full, full of animal studies. It's real easy to remember all the toxicity of animal studies. There's only one organ system which hasn't been shown to be affected yet. I think that's the heart. All the rest, aging, birth defects, liver, spleen, cancer, it's been shown. The companies can show that, hey, I can't repeat it. Yeah, well, what do you expect? A negative finding in animals does not cancel out a positive finding. Just like everyone smokes, no cancer in this group doesn't cancel out that these guys didn't get cancer from smoking, really. I mean, that's kind of silly. Okay, we just go through this, and there's only one, this is the final thing. I told you I would ask, is GMO, are we gambling with our future eating GM foods? And the answer is clearly no, okay? Because, remember what gambling is. You know the odds of losing, and so I chose to gamble. In the GMO foods, you have no idea what the odds, the, the negative sides are. So that's in gambling. It's like jumping in a hole and you, you actually don't know how deep it is. Then, contamination of a life form. If you and I were to gamble, and you say, okay, forget it, I'll tell you the odds of losing. That's the first thing. But you and I, you gamble, and every time you lose, I pay. That's not gambling. You gamble, you lose. Why are you giving me the problem? That's what we call contamination, okay? When farmers' fields, whatever, organic, get contaminated, you lose, and you never intended to gamble. And the final thing in gambling is when this has gone on long enough, you keep losing, I keep paying. You say, can, can, I ask you, can, can we please quit? Well, you can't, it's a life form, okay? So on these three things alone, that you don't know the odds of losing, you seem to contaminate the guy who wasn't gambling, and once you decide we've had enough, we cannot stop. It's a life form. That ain't gambling. There's a term for that. And it's either negligent or reckless. I can't remember. It's one of the two. Yeah, see, I put it up here, negligent or reckless. Now, if you do not think we have contamination, it's all over the internet, and you look at, here's a cool study, Bear LL601, long grain rice, which was never approved for consumption. Well, they planted it from whatever, 93 to 99 or something, then they pulled it off the market, and five or six years later, you know, they were gonna plant normal rice again, it was contaminated. And so they looked, how did this thing get contaminated? I thought we pulled it off the fields. They spent a billion dollars looking, and they could not find it. Was it in the lab? Was it in the field? Was it in the market? I don't know. But it was contaminated, and Europe wouldn't buy the rice. Okay. So they said, um, in the end, they pleaded act of God. But you know, I, and I wrote them a nasty note, act of God is like Hurricane Katrina. When you see the hurricane, you don't even know what it is, and you cannot declare act of God, number one. And they said, okay, okay, let's just move forward. Next year, we're gonna plant. We got seed. They looked in their seed, it was contaminated. And by the way, when they looked at the contamination of Bear LL601, they found Bear LL602 a previously controlled thing, which it got there too. I mean, they didn't even know that was there. And do you want to go investigate and declare act of God for bare LL602? It's kind of, you know, being kind of facetious, but that's how it goes. Now, that's gonna end the star. Oh, here's all the things we've won. We've won mostly in the, in the, in the court. We've won in the counties to block Kahlo, and Kauai is trying to do a disclosure. They wanted, they wanted GMO moratorium but they bargained away and they have disclosure of pesticides, buffer zones around the schools and towns, and a health study. Uh, I was working with Bruce and Joe and 
um, <coughs> Satya, and I guess uh, we are going to try for the moratorium, but it won't be through council people. It'll be a referendum. That is really the way you should go. If it's so worrisome that you're going to put a buffer zone around school, ask for a health study, ask for disclosure of pesticides with all their combinations, then you should moratorium it until you finish those things. I mean, really, that's kind of common sense, right? Now, one more thing. Kauai sued because of the pesticides associated with GMOs. It's like when there was disclosure, there was tons of chemicals. And I had no idea what some of this stuff was. But the EPA was there. The EPA controls pesticides. And our position always has been any combination of chemicals, drugs, or pesticides is considered a new drug or combination to proven otherwise. Now, I just asked them this, EPA, do you agree? Stonewall, just no answer. <laughs> so some of the citizens says, hey, hey, he's talking to you. <laughs> Sorry, Arizona, but that, that's how Hawaiians ask <laughs> nicely. And he says, each of the compounds has been tested separately. Yeah, that wasn't the question. A combination has been used that has to be proven together, just like the Roundup and the surfactant. We can, I can name you dozens of studies in our drugs where the combination was terrific horrific or terrific. And sometimes they negate each other, sometimes they add. But what he said is, like, some of the compounds, when tested separately, we use 1,000 fold below that threshold. Hey, that's some of the compounds. And then I presented studies where the synergism is 3,000 to 7,000 fold. I mean, it, it gets ludicrous, okay? And I didn't go to school to argue with the head of EPA over this kind of stuff. Okay. But National Institute in NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety Health, another federal group, safety health, occupational, they agree 100% compounds of drugs, new product to prove in other ways. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine, they would tell you, Dr. Pan, while you're compounding the drugs, don't forget the GMOs. Maybe there's a GMO and a drug. That could surely be because the GMO produces the products which are proteinaceous, and some of the drugs you use are plastic-like, and you're looking for hormones now, the hormone mimickers of the plastic. Hey, hey, all bets are off. We do things empirically. We don't try to second guess what we think it's going to be, and that's called deterministic or risk assessment. And I just want to zoom ahead. Why, so if it, well, why aren't we moving ahead? Well, conflict of interest, conflict of interest, conflict of interest, financial conflict of interest. Now, I'll read this for you. There was a bad conflict of interest with drugs and vaccines. The pharmaceutical guys were really presenting half the data. We had to recall many things. And so all the people, this is back in uh, 2005, I think. They said, wait, hey, hey, all the regulators have conflict of interest. All the testifiers have conflict of interest. Every time we call a meeting together, we bring in the stakeholders. When we regulated drugs and vaccines for the World Health Organization, that was a stupid thing to say. Hey, I got all the regulators. Those guys got the conflict, uh, not, not the regulators, I got all the stakeholders. That's the drug companies. Why would you have a drug company voting on the value of his drugs? So we exclude the financial stakeholders. But not in America, not in our government. We like stakeholders. The only valid stakeholder is a consumer. But the NIH, oops, the NIH, tried to weed out all the conflict of interest. And they said, it's so infiltrated into our regulatory agencies, we're gonna defi define it for you first before we tell you how to remove it. It must cover financial interests, yep, gifts, gratuities, favors, nepotism, and other such areas such as political participation and bribery. What is political participation doing between nepotism and bribery? These aren't my words, these are the NIH. Now, when I was down in Brazil, I'll leave you with one final comment. The Brazilians, they're great, smart people, and they have a personality which is charming. They say that about me too, but just ignore that. <laughs> they do not like comments like, oh, those politicians. They will always correct you on the spot. You didn't mean that. You mean some politicians. They certainly are good ones. Okay. So I said, try again and again. Sometimes I slip, you know, I say, oh, those lawyers. No, that, 
You didn't mean that. There are some good lawyers. And they say that, number one, do not be cynical. When you go out there, don't be cynical. Don't say you, Monsanto. There are good guys in Monsanto. They are being suppressed by their head. The real good guys quit because they can't stand it anymore and you see them coming through. So don't be cynical, okay? And try to move forward. I think we'll end it there. Any questions? Thank you. I guess if you want to turn on the lights, we could have questions. Since uh, you are speaking as a private citizen, I actually have a, a question about your employer, if, if you can answer it. I was horrified watching the GMO labeling uh, input in Senate. I was horrified to see Ross Baker shut it down, and, and it was simply wrong what was done. My question is, was there input to that committee from the organization that, that you work for, was that asked for, was that welcomed, and what was the input? Yes, we've been uh, going to the state senate oh, for the last five or six years. You never hear about it because we never seem to move out of committee because Cliff Suji from the House Ag was controlling it. Walter really <laughs> got Cliff Suji removed, and you met her, uh, uh, Representative Woolsey. She's very good. So now. We're not going to be cynical. We're not going to say, oh, those state guys. That state guy wasn't so good, but now we got new guys. And so we will be promising. I really did forget to go over the list of all the counter arguments Monsanto says. So I'll try to sneak one in with each question. What will they say? These promoters, these mutations, they're natural. They use the promoter cauliflower mosaic virus. When you eat cauliflower, there's a mosaic virus. What's your problem? It's natural. Hey, water's natural. In the wrong amount, in the wrong presentation, it'll kill you. Salt is natural. Oxygen is natural. In a newborn, it'll blind you. This is not a question of natural. It's a question of timing and quantity. Next question. <laughs> no, no, well, no. Lauren, what about all the chemicals? And uh, in the past, some of the chemicals were proven to percolate down into the water supply? Yes. The question was, the past chemicals that we have used in sugarcane and pineapple percolate into the water supply. Mm. Now, <clears throat> that's why some of our water supplies are closed, closed off, right? That's why sometimes the EPA says, look, each of those combinations that we used to use are there, but they're all below the limits. But you should also say, they're in combination. You have to prove safety in combination. And really, guys, when you think about it, what does combination mean? Because the industry will say this a lot. We didn't spray them together. We sprayed one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So if you spray it together, that's combination. If they persist in their environment and overlap, that's combination. If they don't persist in the environment but persist in you, clearance from the body, that's combination. And finally, if they clear the body but leave some kind of damage like to your liver, then the other one comes along and then damages your other part of the liver, that's combination. The damages overlap, this combination. You got, they got a long way to go to prove this stuff is safe. And, you know, they call me, what do they call me? So I'm like, you're going to bust the bank. It's expensive, impossible to do. Well, guys, we have alternatives. We could not use them and just plant organic stuff. This is not, this is not the cure to cancer. This is not the cure to cancer. By the way, when they come to you for informed consent, will you let me plant GM papaya by you that you could eat maybe? And what are the benefits? Feed the world, all right? Just say it then. To feed the world, you put me at risk. Hmm, I can choose not to. I can choose not to. And if there's one person says, oh, I didn't sign it, the answer is no, okay? Life form. Next question. Um, yeah. You, you talked about the uh, gentleman that looked like Dick Cheney, and when you said uh, monocropping is bad, and he said, yes, yes, monocropping is bad, that's why uh, it's a matter of national security, because we want all of our enemies to do monocropping so that we can easily kill them, and then you said, why do you Not do kill them, them, control them, control them. Control them. And then you said, yeah, but why are you doing it here? We're not the enemies, and he said, well, so that it looks like, well, we think it's okay, so it must be okay. 
Would you say that, that that would be the same principle then with GMOs, that they're, that they're having us Americans use the GMOs so that they can convince our enemies to Wait. use them and have control over them also? Okay, the question was, when I talked to that Homeland Security guy who said monocropping is good for us to give to them, but bad for us to use, and was it, that was GMO, that wasn't pesticide, that was GMOs. You, you, you can control people if you control their food. You don't have to invade them or bomb them or drone them. Or, you can just control their food. Okay. And where's the collateral damage? Yeah, we are the kind of um, collateral damage, but 80% of the rest of the nation, their food supply has GMOs. The next issue, people will tell you, oh, it's contaminated all our rice and corn and soy. It's hopeless. It's contaminated. There's only maybe five or six types of mutations. That's like... I dump five or six drugs in your water supply. Odd as it is, at least you didn't have me dump 15 or 72. So yes, corn and soy and cotton, canola is contaminated. But it's of that one type. At least you don't have all the other types yet. Yet. Yes. Lauren, yeah. if um, pesticides are put on the fields up yes. in uh, Kihei and all over this island, and we have no idea what day they're spraying, and we have a wind blowing anywhere on this island, that means that we all can be affected at any moment in time. Correct. So uh, it seems like if there was some way to demand uh, or request whichever we want to use, that uh, we be told what day the, the winds are, uh, or the, the pesticides are being put in the fields so that something could be done about it. And then I'm wondering, the second part is, if, uh, let's say it's raining, it's pouring, it's on the side of the island, let's say Kihei, and it's uh, the water, like right now, we're supposed to be in a kind of potential uh, flooding, you know, on this side of the island. Um, so when flooding goes on and it's washing into the ocean, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to warn people that this would be a time not to go in the water? Perhaps the water, too, is then polluted for three days, five days, seven days? Okay. What's your feedback on that? Okay, the first question was, if they're going to spray, can they tell us ahead of time so we can not be there? I can only tell you about the Kauai, the outbreak in the elementary school three or four times on Kauai, where they spray next to the GM company. Uh, <laughs> The way they spray, they plan to spray, and they're supposed to tell them, we plan to spray. They could, but they don't. They don't even have to disclose. But some days when they said, well, we're going to spray today, the winds are bad, and they don't spray. Sometimes they start to spray, and the winds are bad. Can we just kind of finish up? That's when the kids got sick. And the kids kind of had classic symptoms of some of the pesticides they were spraying. The next question was, suppose you spray, and the rains come. The wind condition was correct to spray, but it rained and flooded it into the ocean. I don't know if you know about this, but Kauai had a massive die-off at the river mouth that, of the Waimea River mouth surrounded by those fields, like 50,000 dead sea urchins. The EPA uses the sea urchin as one of the markers for environmental toxicity. Okay? So everyone said, hey, look at that. And what was the EPA's response? Stonewall again. I mean, I don't know how to interpret stonewalling, but you are correct. Except the winds change so frequently here, it's kind of like cane burning, the smoke. Yeah. They started off, and then the winds change, and it's like, well, it's already lit. Mm. So <laughs> it's kind of rough. Yes? Is it your threat? Uh, sorry. Yes. Oh. What measures do you recommend we can take to um, protect ourselves from all these adverse effects? Okay. The question is, I think that means personally, how would you yes. protect yourself? Personally. Me? I'm kind of a slob. I don't pay attention that much, only because my wife pays attention. She'll sort out my diet <laughs> so that <laughs> she'll go through it. If she didn't go through it, I would have to do it. Okay. The Brazilians focus exactly on organic. It's, it's, not even a, it's not even a question of labeling. They know what's contaminated and they focus. 
We're not going to label the, 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 the bad crops, you know, soy, cotton, canola, corn. Try to avoid those. And which is very good because um, food sovereignty, uh, well, at least the starches, we are supposed to grow our own starches, right? When the ships stop coming, I'm not going to say, where's my bell pepper? I'm going to say, where's my wheat, my rice, and my corn? Sugar cane. Well, sugar cane. Let's forget. Well, the sugar cane is not that productive now. But look at the Hawaiian, what well, the native things, yeah? Kalo, sweet potato, breadfruit, and cooking banana, plantain. That's not Hawaiian, but everyone likes cooking banana. Those are high fiber starches. Those are actually really good for you, kind of easy to grow. And if you grow them, like sweet potato, that thing grows like a weed. And some people say, well, I grow so much, I can't eat it. I'll bet you can contract like the Big Island with the hotels. And they will offer to the tourists local food. Believe me, the guy didn't fly 3,000 miles to eat the stuff we flew in the, the cargo pack with him. And the, the chefs can make anything local terrific. OK, so we should try to move to food sovereignty. But rather than just say fruits, vegetables, fruits, vegetables, let's just go with the high fiber starches. OK, sorry, that was a digress. Uh, next thing that the, the company will tell you company would tell you is, hmm, ah, mankind has been modifying genes gajillion years, starting with that pollination. They will redefine. They say, I don't want to talk about GMOs. Let's call that biotech. OK, so you got this biotech, including cross-pollination and GMOs. We've been doing biotech for gillions of years. What's your problem? We're stepping it up now. First of all, don't lump it together. There's GMOs, which is unnatural, and they're crossing. I mean, that's number one. Number two, if you say in the history of life, I'll bet you some gene crossed into your gene because of the virus. Yeah, I admit that. I share stuff with the fish. But my ancestors paid a price. If that crossing was not useful, it died out. And over the billions of years, I'm left with useful stuff. You are trying to rush it and force it on us. And all the horrible things which my ancestors paid during the millennium is going to appear in us quickly. Okay? And like I said, why are you doing this? Ostensibly, it's to feed the world. But I think it's well proven we can feed the world just by redistribution, diversification, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Next question. Yes. I work in the pineapple field. One day, they gave the pineapple plants to the cat. Yes. After that, they threw away all the milk. Yes. It was contaminated. Yes. But yet, they didn't tell us if the pineapple was contaminated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> OK, what he's referring to was in the, what, the 90s or something? They used a pesticide called heptachlor, long acting, related to DDT, suspected carcinogen. And I guess it was concentrated in the tops of pineapple. You are right. I never actually thought was the fruit contaminated. But for sure, it was in the leaf. They feed the leaf to the cattle so they don't waste it. The heptachlor is concentrated in the milk of cattle, like this class of chemicals. So they had to stop that, condemn the milk. The head of the Department of Health was fired for that, because apparently he knew about it. I mean, it's one thing to make a dumb mistake, but it's another thing to know about it and you know, just hide it. But that's correct. But until today, I've never ever thought that the pineapple itself might be contaminated. But we stopped using, we stopped using heptachlor long ago. Just even though we don't feed the tops to the cattle anymore. But that is one thing you will see. You mess with the environment, and you're messing with a complex system. Okay. Okay. 
Any more questions? Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Um, in the newspaper this week, uh, Monsanto was quoted as saying that an organic papaya farmer on the same farm as a, as a GMO papaya farmer has no fear of contamination. Is that true? Like a, an organic For papaya me, farmer and well, on the same farm as an, a GMO yeah, papaya farmer? Well, th that's, I'm sorry, but that's, so the question was, some organic farmer who has GMO papaya on his, amongst his organic non-GMO papaya, he said he has no fear. Well, to me, I mean, that's like saying smoking causes cancer. This guy smokes, he has no fear. I smoke, I don't care. Hey, that's you, okay? If he, if he wants to do it for himself and has no fear, fine. But we sampled into Pune, and we went to papaya plants that were never intended to be GMO, and 50% were. Now, if he's going to be bold and get sensational and say, well, I don't have fear, that's good. Speak for yourself. But don't let it come to my property without my informed consent. It's like smoking. The guy smokes and says, I don't have fear. Good. Don't blow it on us. And uh, is it true that the FDA does not approve GMOs because they do not consider it any different from any other food, and they don't approve any foods. You know, foods are not something they, they regulate, so they really don't approve GMOs. Is that true? Wait, wait, wait. So, sorry, the FDA, the FDA has a principle called substantial equivalence. Right. And that means that the GMO foods are substantially equivalent to regular foods. So they claim there's no need for testing. But the FDA should never ever function on opinion. When I worked with them in the 80s, the rep reputation was built on data. Then you saw what the FDA scientists say about the FDA. They can't afford, they don't understand it. It's not part of their vision using genome tech science to guide their thing. So if they want to give an opinion now, give an opinion. But I will always ask for the data. Okay. By the way, I. Long ago, I sat down with Monsanto at the University of Hawaii, and I said, can't you just do seed corn like you used to without GMO? They said, no, 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 no money, no patent. I said, oh, okay. Are you ever afraid of being sued when there's harm? You're going to say, you can't sue us. We're just doing what the regulators tell us to do. It's a perfect marriage, industry and regulation, where you just do what the regulators he told me I don't have to worry about it, so I didn't. The issue is with the regulators. And the regulators, the FDA, the EPA, sleep at the wheel. Yes. Oh, the microphone. Okay, right. we're, we're gonna take one more question. I can tell you the regulators in the foreign countries, they're not asleep at the wheel. They just don't have the financial conflict of interest. I'm just curious if uh, you could comment on, I mean, there was just a, an initiative in Washington State that was probably defeated, a GMO labeling yeah. initiative. The industry poured $22 million into yeah. that fight to defeat it by lying through the media. And so I'm wondering how that relates to this effort um, at a county level, um, et cetera, if you have any reflections on that. Yes. Uh, you will always see, and you know when they fight you fiercely, that you've touched a nerve. So that kind of gives you extra stimulus to go on. The other issue is when we go for legislation, I, I, I like litigation, but we'll do legislation. And we have always said, win or lose, we're getting out a lot of education. And sometimes we lose, but gee, look at all the people now. In the end, they might pour so much money, and sometimes they will confuse the issue. If you vote this way, it's really no, there's a double-edged sword, blah, blah, blah. But that's why we want to start this initiative now. Do not think that because Maui is small, they just kind of, ah, those guys on Maui are nuts. They are watching every piece of le litigation of legislation. I suspect that, what did they say on Kauai? When Kauai was moving the bill through the council, they said, can you not vote on that quite yet? The state wants to make controls of the GM and pesticide voluntary amongst the industry. In other words, 
we'll do what you say, but we want to volunteer to do it. But sometimes they will volunteer for a week, and then like, well, all bets are off. Sometimes they will do more than you ask. To see? See how good it is? When we volunteer, we give you more than you want. What do they really want? They want, they do not want a suit. They do not want legislation. They would rather say, we left of our own volition. volition. We did these things of our own choice. Kind of like the super ferry on Kauai. They protested. The super ferry said, well, we don't go to Kauai. Not because you guys protested in the harbor, but because it wasn't economically correct at the time. They do not like to be defeated because it sets the example for other governments, state, county, feds, foreign feds, to take action, because it works. So everyone's watching. Everyone watch Kauai. Yours will be slightly different, a referendum. It'll be interesting. Win or lose, we'll educate ourselves. It'll be a little bloody near the end. But hey, it's worth it. Thank you. I'll be here for questions afterwards if you want to.